<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. So this is an OpenXR tutorial, specifically doing rapid prototyping with OpenXR. So I'll talk about the low-level OpenXR experience outside of the game engine. So who am I? Um, if you were here for the last one, <laughs> this will be repeat, but my name is Alfredo Muñiz, and my day job is a CTO and co-founder of Exceed LLC. We develop uh, full-body motion trackers, and I'm also the chairman for Kronos as a side thing. Um, that is my email if you have any questions for after the talk. So first, I wanted to start with, um, and this is to make my presentation better. Why are you here? What are you building? Yeah, I want to hear from the crowd. Uh, training simulations for medical education. A, a WebXR VR platform. Uh, yeah, we're an XR training company in Sweden. Uh, so we're uh, building training applications for customers in uh, automotive and defense, uh, maybe even medical in the future. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, very cool. Oh, the four of you. Yep. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that, that's really great. Um, yeah, OpenXR has a lot of applications, and I'm very excited to hear them because, uh, <laughs> you know, in the working group, um, the main focus from our developers is like gaming and, you know, very much uh, just trying to make it sellable to the mass market. <laughs> so I'm happy to hear that uh, there's more uh, noble pursuits out there. <laughs> so um, I'm going to cover what this talk is about and what it's not about. So if you take a look at this diagram, um, you have your game engines, you have WebXR. So these are all, in a way, they're libraries to access OpenXR. However, what we're going to talk about is the low-level approach. So this is where you can write code in, um, for example, Android Studio, and you can use it directly on an OpenXR-compliant device. Um, so I'll go through how to do this with uh, the Quest 2 in this presentation. Um, in terms of using it at a high level, using these uh, game engines, there is a talk tomorrow in this room at 10.30 AM. Uh, Unity will go over how to use OpenXR through their game engine, if you're interested in that. So uh, let's move on. So I believe that um, the low level is underutilized and it's really only used by game engines or software libraries and usually they're only using it as like a another abstraction layer on top of an abstraction layer and sure it makes it easy but there's a couple drawbacks um, mainly when vendors release new features it takes a while um, on the order of a uh, couple of months or maybe even a year for those features to become available in the game engine. Whereas if, um, if you use OpenXR directly, you can use those features, start experimenting with them so that when they do become part of the game engine, you can put them in knowing that they'll work. So you, you can do quite a bit with OpenXR, um, such as isolating specific features. For example, if you just wanted to test um, hand tracking, you can do that in the low level pretty easily, and it'll compile super fast. Game engines, pretty bulky, take a while, um, and you have more control over the devices and the extensions and how they work. Um, you can experiment, so you can add your own API layers. Um, I talked about this in the previous uh, talk, but API layers let you modify existing um, functionality. So if you wanted to do something different that's not being done, um, you'd be able to do that by accessing OpenXR uh, directly. Uh, and you can even create your own extensions. You do not need to be part of the working group to do that. Um, and it just, because of how much simpler it is, because it removes the abstractions, 
uh, you'll actually see how the runtime works. You get to learn how OpenXR works, and you just know that way if you see any bugs when you do use the game engine, um, you can figure it out, you can report bugs, things like that. So, um, and not everything requires large libraries. Maybe you're making something very simple. Um, that would be another use case for using OpenXR at a low level. So in terms of setting it up, it's actually pretty easy. Um, if, you, uh, if you started right now, brought out your laptop, <laughs> you could probably follow along and um, build the tutorial, um, build the example. So um, let's, I'm just going to go through the steps. So I have links there too, um, in case you want to look at the slides after and you want to go through the um, tutorial itself. So a lot of this follows um, the MetaQuest uh, developer website. Um, it is a little outdated, so some of the steps are unnecessary nowadays, but I'll, I'll cover those caveats in this presentation. So first, you'll need to set up the device. So for the Quest 2, um, you'll need to join an organization on Meta. Um, even if you're not part of an organization, you can be an individual with an organization. Um, so that there's no issues there. You need to enable USB debugging. Um, and this is so that when you connect the Quest 2 to your computer, you know, it actually sends the, all the signals over. Um, and one gotcha is that you have to do it in both the headset itself, but also the phone app. Um, if you don't do it in the phone app, then it's not going to sync. And finally, you need to install the Android drivers. Um, and this is just to be able to connect through it through um, Android's ADB um, interface. So that's all pretty quick. Um, the next thing is you want to install Android Studio. Um, it's about a one gigabyte software. <laughs> so it takes a while to actually download. Um, it took me about 30 minutes. So that, that's where the biggest chunk of time will be. <laughs> um, and then that link describes the additional packages you need to install. Basically, the Quest 2 runs on a certain version of Android, and you just need to install that specific version. Um, and then environment variables. So uh, depending on what operating system you use, um, it can be easy or it can be a little more complicated. But um, if you're a programmer, you're probably familiar with uh, how to do it. And then, of course, you need a um, to your path variable add where your binaries are. Um, when you connect to the Quest, you'll see this allow USB debugging. Um, and there's a way to uh, always trust the computer, which I recommend. Otherwise, it's going to do like 100 pop-ups <laughs> when it's just sitting idle. Um, all right. And this was, I did this tutorial myself. Um, yesterday. So this is pretty fresh. And I know it works. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, OpenXR, we have in the repository uh, one example that goes through what is OpenXR and how to run the simplest thing. So we call it Hello XR. And what you need to do is you need to download this um, OpenXR SDK source from GitHub. Um, and then you'll open the project in Android Studio. You'll then, um, you'll only need to do one modification, and that's uh, to update the manifest to include this com Oculus intent category VR. Um, and that's it. So you no longer need to update the, the loader that it says on the other page, on Meta's page, um, which is pretty nice. So you'll compile it, and then you'll run it. And what it is is um, you'll see this blue square that always follows you. And then if you pick up your controllers, um, those will be tracked. So you're able to see them um, in 3D, and they show up as cubes. And if you pull the trigger, um, that cube will get smaller. And if you pull it, uh, I think it's like 90%. 
it'll start to vibrate. So it, it also shows off the haptics. Um, so uh, that's pretty cool. And it is one of the basic examples. So um, I recommend if you're new to OpenXR that you do this first because it'll really give you a good idea of how it works. So right now I'm going to actually go through um, the example itself. First, by giving um, an overview of um, a typical OpenXR app. So first, you need to create an instance. Um, and the instance basically says, uh, this is a headset. This is what it does. Um, this is what it supports. That sort of thing. And this is the graphics API that it uses. Um, you'll need to, so the device will tell you um, what it supports. So it, it'll tell you, is this a one screen? Is it two screens? Um, is it for your head? Is it just like a standalone thing? Um, and then you'll need to set up the bindings. So these are the actual actions. Um, and I'll talk more about these later because the action system is a bit complicated. Um, and then you'll create your session. Um, a swap chain, uh, swap out the buffers for the two displays. And then the loop, the grand loop, um, it just updates everything. So all the poses, uh, the inputs, the haptics, and the displays. So it's, at a high level, very simple. Um, <laughs> if you open up the code, it's very long. <laughs> and it may be a little daunting. Um, so I'm going to try to break it down in a way that's uh, not as uh, scary. <laughs> so um, first, you'll see initializations. So this is uh, specifically in in main, so main.cpp, or I, I think in there it's um, hello xr.cpp. Um, but it starts off with these uh, kind of class initializations. So you'll have three the platform plugin, the graphics plugin, and then the um, OpenXR program itself. So the platform plugin, that is um, that is to abstract away the actual platform. So whether it's a head-mounted display or a handheld display, such as a AR phone, um, it doesn't matter to OpenXR, but OpenXR needs to know to be able to abstract that away. Um, same as whether it's a single display or a dual display. And then the blend mode, which uh, Danny will talk more about in uh, his presentation. <laughs> and then we also want to abstract away the uh, graphics API. So whether you're using D3D12, Vulkan, or OpenGL, um, your application doesn't need to know about that. Um, but it does need to be specified by the um, device itself, which one it's using, so that it can load the proper um, API. So, and then program is where you actually write your code. So, um, you'll see here more code snippets. So, the program class um, has a create instance, which um, establishes the connection to the runtime. We call it runtime. You can think of it as headset. Um, cause that's what it is with the, with a few exceptions, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's better to just think about it as a headset. And then, um, this will let you sort of print the properties of that specific headset. So if you just have a quest, you're able to see what it supports. Um, and then all the different properties that it has, uh, which is very nice cause, um, Otherwise, you wouldn't know. <laughs> so that's the way for it to tell you what it can and cannot do. Um, you'll then initialize the system. Um, let's see. And then you'll want to initialize the device. So the graphics API needs the system ID and the instance handle from initialize the system to be able to do the graphics API. So 
these are details that they're kind of just the, uh, what do you call it? They're kind of just automatic. You just put it in the app. Um, you don't really need to know how it works. Um, but the example itself, it does have comments. So you can at least understand or um, read the comment of what it does. So from there, you can initialize session, which uh, connects it to the graphics API. And then you'll set the reference space, the view, local, or stage. And these are all specified in the OpenXR specification. So they describe different ways um, that the view will be seen. And then the action set, which will be described in detail on the next page. Um, and then the swap chain. So the swap chain is just um, where you're able to render the consecutive views um, without having like screen tearing. So they just go back to back. So it looks like a smooth picture. So here's an overview of the action system. Um, we decided, uh, well, the people before me decided to make it human centric and not computer centric. So if you think of a standard such as um, HID, for example, um, the human interface device with the USB, uh, you're able to manipulate buttons directly. Um, OpenXR decided, let's abstract away the hardware. Let's make it such that um, the developer doesn't need to care about the hardware. They only need to care about what it's doing. So this is where this action system came to be, where... For example, if you want something to be grab, a grab action, um, different uh, vendors will implement that differently, but they would bind to their own um, hardware-specific um, uh, platform. So that's the general idea, and we're, we're trying to expand it to make it more uh, compatible with um, game engines because game engines do a lot more, and we're trying to meet them where they are. So it'll go through a little revamping, but it's for the better. Um, still keeping the same logic of uh, abstracting away the hardware, focusing on what is the user doing. Um, and then, so this is done by what we call bindings and interaction profiles. So if you develop, for example, on the uh, MetaQuest, Oculus Quest 2, then you would be using their interaction profile. You can suggest that to the app, and then the runtime will read that, and they'll be like, oh, this um, application was developed with this controller in mind. The runtime, the headset, will then say, oh, OK, that's not my controller but I can map that to my own controller. So that's the idea behind that. Um, and lastly, there's the while loop that I mentioned. So this will just pull actions and render until you tell it to stop. Um, not much more there. <laughs> so those are pretty much the basics. Um, there is a lot more to low-level OpenXR development, such as um, adding in extensions and API layers. These are completely optional, but they, do, they are pretty powerful, and they add additional functionality. Um, with the OpenXR, uh, with HelloXR, um, it is a nice exercise to add in extensions or API layers um, as like a practice. <laughs> and then... Um, there's action system multiplexing. So if you read the specification, the action system is, again, this complicated, garbled mess um, that works good in simple cases. But when you start complicating it and having multiple bindings to the same action, it gets very uh, confusing very quickly. Um, so it's worth reading up on that. And then the OpenXR loader is not touched on at all in this presentation. And there's a lot of little details like that. And 
um, it's beyond the scope of this presentation because a lot of it is you kind of have to learn as you go. And um, unfortunately, that's the reality of a lot of software development. Um, and OpenXR is uh, no exception. So if you want to, once you build um, Hello XR, I recommend um, getting the Oculus Mobile SDK and running their examples. So they have a couple of like eye tracking, hand tracking, um, and they're pretty complete. So you're able to see on a low level how those things work, how to add extensions, that sort of thing. Um, and if things are unclear, the answer is most likely in the specification itself. Um, again, this big document that may slow down your computer. <laughs> and it covers a lot of things such as initialization, instances, um, the input and haptics, and even the extensions and API layers. So it's pretty thorough. If there's something we missed um, or something that's unclear, um, that is something we would like to hear from the community so that we can fix it and make it more, um, more direct. So you can do that by um, leaving an issue on our public GitHub, um, specifically OpenXR docs or OpenXR SDK source, where you downloaded the example. Um, we can also be reached at the Discord channel, which is linked here. Um, some members are pretty active on there and they will respond like within a few hours. So um, we're a pretty good community. Uh, we're about 50 developers or so from, you know, Meta, Microsoft, and um, a lot of uh, big and small companies. And I think we're all pretty passionate trying to move this forward and just trying to make XR a, a better, easier place for developers to make applications. Um, so that's it for my portion of the presentation. Um, Denny will come up here and give his portion, and then we can um, take questions. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so now we're going to change focus a little bit and uh, look at how to enable uh, video pass-through. So <clears throat> in uh, 10 minutes, you're going to learn how to do this. Uh, it's actually super easy once you know how to code for OpenXR. Uh, essentially, there are two takeaways here. So first, if you're an application developer or a game engine developer, uh, the takeaway is that OpenXR is here today to support this use case. Secondly, if you're a device manufacturer, then the takeaway is that you can bring your device to OpenXR and then enable this functionality with the core OpenXR that we have today. So I'm uh, Denner Öngren. Uh, I joined the OpenXR working group in 2018 when I was working for Toby. And then, then I was working mainly with eye tracking. Uh, recently, I joined uh, Vario. And uh, like now, I work as a developer and as a PM actually to support our headset and try to drive the standardization forward. And it's actually quite nice to be both developer and PM actually. <laughs> so let's get started. Uh, so uh, here we have, you know, like the spectrum of uh, devices and on uh, let's see, the left hand side, we have a VR device and a VR device uh, replaces all of your real world with uh, rendered content. Uh, then the two devices on the right are uh, mixed reality devices. So like we have the Magic Leap 2 and then we have Vario XR3. They are using different technologies in order to do this. So uh, the Magic Leap uh, uses something that's called optical see-through. Uh, and then they add, uh, how do you say, like pixels on top of the real world because you uh, essentially wear it like a uh, pair of glasses. But the video pass-through is uh, different because then you have low latency RGB cameras that are pointing outwards 
and it's very important, is uh, low latency. And here we have the opportunity to completely, uh, completely re replace the real world or to mix them together. And it's actually quite easy to make them blend together because both of them are rendered on the same display. Uh, so the goal here uh, in the next 10 minutes uh, to go through the APIs needed uh, to render mixed reality, uh, understand the system and the user preference for uh, VR or mixed reality, because it can actually be a preference. Uh, and as a bonus, uh, we will promote uh, proper occlusion. And you might wonder, what is occlusion? So if you look in the video here, uh, I actually have a demo that's been compiled for our headset. And here you can see uh, the mixed reality. But you see here when uh, the hand is waving in front, front of the virtual content, uh, the hand is actually occluding uh, the content. And the desk is actually doing the same thing. Uh, it's not necessary for all runtimes to support this uh, or the hardware uh, that you use that it needs to support it, but still we, uh, I will uh, share a little bit, little bit how to do it. And then I will also share some uh, pitfalls uh, because the beauty uh, today is that the industry is act actually adopting uh, visual uh, pass-through and uh, later at AWE, we're going to do uh, like one announcement for one of the applications. Uh, and uh, just the other week, I discovered some pitfalls with, you know, like a big game that was actually turning on our mixed reality mode by accident. So I will, I will, I will actually share that as well. So uh, I don't know if you have seen this. But this is the reference card for the APIs that are part of the core uh, OpenXR specification. And it's available on the OpenXR homepage. Uh, and you can see that I highlighted uh, the places where you need to code uh, or change the logic a little bit in order to enable uh, mixed reality. So we have the XR enumerate environment blend modes, with actual, which actually uh, you need to inspect in order to understand if the device uh, support uh, video pass through. Uh, and then you have XR end frame, and this is you know like the the place where you interact with a compositor. So after you have created your graphics frame, you will hand it off to the compositor, and then you can actually ask the compositor to uh, blend it with uh, uh, the video see-through or video pass-through. And then you can see the optional step there uh, on XR create swap chain, where you can actually create a depth buffer. And depth buffer is important if you want to do this uh, occlusion that, uh, that I was talking about. And in general, it's always good to provide depth because it uh, helps helps us with uh, doing reprojection as well. So uh, checking the capability, uh, super easy. Uh, you invoke the XR enumerate environment blend modes, uh, and there are actually three things that you uh, that the runtime can uh, report. It's actually a list that's going to be uh, handed back. So like you have the opaque rendering mode, and this is for uh, the VR use case, where you submit uh, RGB images. Depth or transparency is not being used at all there. So like the alpha channel is not being used. Uh, and then you have the add additive uh, blend mode. Uh, and this is, for instance, to support um, HoloLens 2 or Magic Leap 2. And here uh, you provide RGB images as well. Uh, and alpha is not being used. So transparency is being um, rendered by, um, uh, like all the black content is going to be uh, rendered uh, transparently. Uh, but then you have the alpha blend mode. Uh, an alpha blend mode, then this is the only mode where you use uh, the alpha channel. Uh, and 
And this is a key distinction that you always need to think about. Uh, because this here you really need to provide uh, proper alpha in order for things to work. And you can see uh, the headset down um, um, <laughs> at the bottom actually can support all three of these modes. Uh, so like if you have a device with uh, video see-through, you can actually support all of these three rendering modes. So, uh, why was the list ordered? Uh, why was the blend, blend mode order? Uh, so, this is actually a way for the runtime to uh, specify the recommended or preferred mode by either the system or the user. And it might be cases where, for instance, if the user is at home, like maybe he doesn't want to have a mixed reality experience. So, uh, this thing you need to keep in mind if you implement support for it or if you're using this. Uh, try to respect the order that the blend mode is uh, coming back from. And uh, please also note that it's possible for a headset to support uh, multiple, multiple uh, blend modes. So like for VR headsets, it's not that common to do that. Or for most devices, it's actually not common to do that. You can see that the Vario uh, XR3, uh, we prefer to have alpha blend, uh, in, um, alpha blending first, and then opaque uh, rendering uh, as the second option. But uh, the Valve Index uh, actually prefers or only support uh, opaque uh, rendering. Uh, and it's very important to not to think, uh, always pick the first mode. Uh, instead, think about like what, what your application needs. And um, if you don't find your preferred render mode uh, at the top of the list, please just continue to go through the list. So, uh, programming steps. Uh, again, uh, first step was checking the device capability with uh, enumerate environment blend modes. Select the top blend mode that you plan to support. Uh, and the second step, instruct the compositor to use the blend mode. So this is in uh, XRN frame. Uh, so what you do there is essentially set the environment blend mode uh, to uh, the blend mode that you have picked. And you can see that in, uh, in the uh, right square, this is the only place where you need to change. Uh, so uh, just to recap what's happening after you have done that, then your application actually submits color and alpha, hands it over to the compositor. The compositor on its side uh, gets the color information from the uh, RGB cameras that face facing the world. Take that in, uh, marry them together with the proper timestamps and all of that, and then send the images out to the headset display. If uh, you are submitting depth, and uh, it's pretty much always a good idea to submit depth. Uh, maybe if you, yeah, it's always a good opportunity to submit depth. Then you're using the Cronus extension uh, composition layer depth and provide uh, um, two images for that that you hand over to the compositor. If the runtime and the headset has the ability to get the depth uh, from the real world, uh, it can provide that. And here I'm saying for the Vario headset, we have two extensions uh, that you need to enable. And that's uh, one uh, is to uh, turn on the sensors to actually get the depth data. And then the second is to ask the compositor to actually use the depth data during compositing. If you have done that, then you will, you will get the proper depth uh, of occlusion. And we also have the opportunity to do this uh, without enabling the extensions. Uh, as long as you are submitting uh, depth. But the default behavior is that you need to enable the extensions uh, to get the functionality. So uh, that's it. You know, like that's uh, 
after I've done all, all the stuff and implemented rendering, you, you can get something that's uh, this pretty and engaging. So let's go over to the pitfalls. Uh, and this is uh, recent learnings. Um, so don't support a blend mode without actually testing it. Uh, and this is to highlight that alpha ch channel is used only in alpha blend mode, but not in the other blend modes. So what does that mean? Yeah, like for your application, it actually can con contain garbage or be used for something else. And that might be, you know, like it's a bad idea to ship the application and then actually let the user uh, find this out. Second thing is uh, some adjustments of assets might be necessary. So like if you come with um, um, additive, if you have implemented additive rendering, then you have black as the transparent color. So uh, then it can be quite common that um, like in your rendering, you actually get black edges uh, on the rim of your objects. Uh, so that you need to take care of. Uh, usually not a big thing, but something to be aware of. And then uh, third learning, uh, don't get into the habit of just picking the first uh, blend mode that the runtime supports. And it's very, 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 very easy to get into that habit if you are only working with runtimes that support one blend mode. Instead, think about what kind of experience that uh, you want your app to have for different blend modes and then actually opt in to the blend modes that you are uh, planning to support. So uh, to recap, uh, enumerate environment blend modes. Uh, um, uh, here you can in inspect the capabilities of the device. Make sure to listen to user, user preference. This is looking at the order uh, from uh, the, list, uh, the ordered list of the blend modes that, are, that the runtime reports. Then you have XR end frame. Uh, the only thing that you need to do here is to uh, pick the video pass through comp compositor enum value or uh, whatever uh, blend mode that you have supported. And also, please uh, make sure to uh, submit depth. And this actually gives opportunity for the runtime to um, implement, uh, how do you say, like proper uh, occlusion handling uh, in, your, in your app. Just because the device that you are working with doesn't support occlusion, uh, doesn't mean that no other device uh, can do it. And uh, the last takeaway here is if you're a device manufacturer uh, making video pass-through, OpenXR is uh, ready for your device today. Questions? Yeah, the question was, uh, op uh, Core OpenXR is not ready unless you use the uh, depth ex extension. Uh, yes, that's, that, that's correct. So, yeah, that's correct. So, Denny, how does uh, the video pass through devices, how do they support all three blend modes? Uh, yeah, the, the opaque uh, blend mode is easy because, uh, you know, like then we're not just using the video pass-through. But then for additive, uh, we actually don't have support for it today, but, but we, we could do it. Basically, wouldn't additive be almost the same as um, the mixed, but just without the depth in a way, where just it's basically just painting it on top of whatever you're seeing? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And, you know, like internally, we, we had that discussion if we, you know, like would support it. But, you know, like we, did, we, we, uh, we just didn't implement it. But, you know, like since there are devices coming out today that supports, uh, supports additive, you know, like it, it might actually make sense. It um, seem, yeah, it seems like Alpha Blend would just replace additive. Like you wouldn't even really need additive if you can support Alpha Blend, right? Yeah. Uh, but then it depends on the application, of course. Sure. I mean, if if, if they if, if they don't pick up the alpha blend mode, you know, like then it, it might make yeah. sense to support the additive. Sure. Yeah. Oh, also happy to 
take any general questions on OpenXR? Yeah, I've got one for OpenXR. Uh, talking about the API layers, would those be more specifically used for uh, creating um, device-specific functionality on top of the OpenXR? So are, are they more... I'm not really sure how to describe it. Like, like, if it, like, let's say I was using OpenXR to build for both the Quest and the Vario. Maybe the Vario has extra things that the Quest doesn't. Would, I, would, would the API layers, is that where that would be used to build functionality for a specific device versus another? Yeah, so what I've seen API layers, um, how, I've been, how I've seen them be used, an example would be if there's a device that gives external data, for example, um, are you familiar with the Vibe Lighthouse trackers? Um, essentially, they're wall-mounted trackers, and they track the pose of different things. So nowadays, uh, things are inside out, where the headset has the camera. It knows where the controller is because it uses the camera and some detection to find out its position. But before that, um, we would have like cameras on the wall, and those would provide the position. So uh, an API layer in that instance would be able to override whatever the runtime is reporting from its cameras, and instead it would use the positions from the um, external trackers. All right. Uh, then I'm just going to do some advertisement as well. So uh, if you want to try a uh, video pass-through, uh, you can come uh, come by our booth uh, tomorrow and actually uh, test it out. Thank you. <laughs>